Grace and peace to you, United Church, and welcome to Worship This Sunday. Just a few notices. A look out in the magazine and the literature we send out for the Santa Shoebox, help for the Ekanini Kresh. Um, we're also looking forward to perhaps helping one of the other creches, the Masifundi Kresh, which we've been involved in for some time, um, and that is in Kaimandu, through a, a saint named Numpilo, who's looking after the children. Um, quite a few children and we just care for her and help them through Christmas. Now um, we're also having a big celebration service next week on the 6th of December and we're having it at Mitre, Mitre's Edge Farm, Bernard and Lola Nichols Farm. We're really excited about this. It's an outdoor service and please bring along your children and Nicola Garrity will be having a scavenger hunt for them in the vineyards. We're really looking forward to celebrating communion for the first time since COVID. We're going to be using Miracle Meals, which is a little package we use for communion. So it's all going to be COVID, um, COVID compliant and uh, hopefully we'll have some coffee and tea and, and afterwards. Please bring along a camping chair and your own muffins to share um, with others. Uh, if you can bring your own mug, that will also be great, but we'll be just looking after um, you there with the communion service and a celebration of Thanksgiving and then a, sh a cup of tea or coffee afterwards. So please come and join us next uh, week, Sunday. We'll be starting the service at 10 o'clock, just to give those who do come to the, the main uh, building, the main built campus at uh, Fenewick Street, the opportunity to drive across to Mitre's Edge if they arrive there at half past nine. So join us 10 o'clock, Mitre's Edge Farm, for a communion service and a Thanksgiving service. Prepare an offering, whatever you'd like to give in order to th give thanks to the Lord for his work among us in the last year. Now, as we come to the Word today, I'd encourage you to, to look back, to remember. If you have given your life to the Lord and you can remember that time, why don't you look back to it and just remember that sense of forgiveness and acceptance and peace that you had as we spend a moment in silence and as, then as we come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your plan of salvation throughout the ages, for the way in which you have met your people from the very dawn of time in the way in which you've pursued us with your love and ultimately sent Jesus. We thank you for his life, perfect life, his death on the cross in our place. We thank you for forgiving us our sins and for giving us resurrection to eternal life. We pray now for your spirit to be over us and in us and through this word to transform us and draw us to him. And so come, Holy Spirit, dwell among us, open your word to us, and let us see Jesus, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Our reading comes out of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1 to 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for you. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways, but when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. 
O oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. Here ends our reading. Amen. So I wonder, have you ever prayed this prayer? And right now it's hard not to feel like things might just be a bit better if God were to show up, if he were to stretch out his arm and make things right. Now for those who have lost jobs and family members and businesses, their homes and cars, this is where we are. We're crying out to God, Lord, show up. Lord, change stuff. Just fix this broken world. Now one of the first families I I ministered to in my life in full-time ministry was about a 13-year-old boy who had lung cancer. And we visited the young man in hospital in Peter Maritzburg, and it was heartbreaking. Helena would sit with him at night just to be a presence there and give his dad a break. I can remember sitting outside the ward and praying this prayer, O Lord, rend the heavens. The little guy's funeral, though, was one of the hardest funerals I've ever done. But it was also one of the easiest. Now, you can imagine why it was hard, but I'll tell you later why it was easier. Everything has changed in the world right now. But when will God show up? In the churches, we frequently ask this question, Lord, when will we see growth in the church? When will we will see people turn back to faith? You, you see, we remember strong Sunday schools, f- full sanctuaries, that hearing the kids singing in the Sunday school while we worshipped the, the great hymns. And we sang out loud at the top of our voices. We listened to the words and our hearts burned within us. Why is it not happening? Why are churches emptying? Is it the music? Is it the prayers? Um, maybe we're not fervent enough or using the right words. Is, is, it, is it the church with its, that it's not well enough advertised? Maybe we need bigger posters and signs. Maybe our greeters need to be retrained or there need to be new courses that are relaunched. Perhaps our Sunday school material is outdated or our teachers need a refresher course. Or maybe we just need a handsome guitarist like the new church down the road. Well, no, no, and no. You see, Isaiah has a desperate cry. But all of these things I've spoken about, they're they're window dressing. What is the church called to? And what is expected of us if we truly want to see God bear his holy arm, as the prophets say? Well, firstly, we look back. That's what Isaiah does. It's good to look back. It's good to look back at our history with God. Isaiah begins with this look back, as we often do, to the good old days. And much of the church is in this place now, especially the traditional church. We're looking back at where we have been and wondering why we're not there now. But the question is, where has COVID left us? Is it broken the church? Has it scattered the church? Or was it just that lockdown has highlighted some of the things that have been wrong for a long, long time? And the Lord has been challenging me in my life in the last few months about where I am and the way I've been preaching. Because I feel at one level like I've been trying to preach people good. And my sermons have been instruction as to how to live to please God. And maybe there's another way. And maybe God's calling us into a different way. The context in which Isaiah lived and worked and preached was the context of Israel, a divided kingdom. It was a, a nation that was divided. It was in civil war. There were the corrupt northern kings. And there was Isaiah in the south preaching to the southern people, be faithful. There was an, a, th- a threat in the south from Assyria and Babylon. And the, these two tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south were crying out, where to from how? God save us, God rescue us. Now, these chapters of Isaiah, scholars recognize as being from the exile. They are cries from a place of fatigue. People have been put away for so long into this place of exile. And now they are feeling the fatigue. Maybe you're feeling the fatigue right now. Maybe you're asking the question, when will God show up and change things? And and what do we do next from this place? Now, Isaiah begins by looking back. In verse 1 he says, Oh, that you'd rend the heavens and come down. Now, this tearing of the heavens is an Old Testament concept. This idea that at points God pierces through this veil into the human world and Jacob's vision springs to mind that ladder which he saw at Bethel when he slept with his head on a stone 
and he looked up and he saw God up at the top of the of the ladder and the angels ascending and descending up upon it in Genesis 28. And then in verse 2 he says, Come down as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. And you can't help thinking that the people hearing this in Isaiah's time would be thinking back to Elijah on Mount Carmel, that time in 1 Kings 18 when Elijah comes up against the prophets of Baal and God sends his fire down upon the the sacrifice in the altar and the fire burns up the sacrifice and then the stones of the altar and, and it causes the water in the trenches around the altar to burn and to boil rather and to evaporate. And so God's power comes down as the the heavens are rent asunder and the, everything is burned up. Or maybe in verse 2 where he says, you cause the nations to quake before you, the, the memory of, of David and Goliath as the Philistines trembled and ran at the sight of the living God as David slayed the, the, the giant with the slingshot. That's in Samuel 1 Samuel 17. Or maybe in verse 3, when he says, You came down and the mountains trembled before you, looking back to the giving of the Lord, Mount Sinai, and when Moses ascended the hill and the glory of the Lord came down in thunder upon the mountain of God. You see, Isaiah is praying, God, show up like this again. Show up in that way and fix this broken place. So looking back is to see where God has worked in our lives. And maybe it's a good time for us to do that, to look back at the times when God has been evident, when he's been manifest in our lives. But what is it that characterizes a time like that? What is it that characterizes God's change, God's changing things in our lives? And the second thing Isaiah does is to look inward. You come to the help of those who gladly do right. You remember who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved, he asks. Isaiah experienced the earthquake associated with the Lord's presence in his life. And what happened in Isaiah's life when the Lord actually showed up when he prayed? It happened in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah sees this vision of the Lord high and exalted. And having seen the glory of the, God, of the Lord and, and his train filling the temple and the thresholds of the temple shaking, Isaiah becomes painfully aware of his own sin. He cries out to God, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And so in verse 5, he, he uses this word we when we continue to sin against them. Not, not excluding himself from the sin of those around him, even though he was the prophet of God, the one chosen, the one faithful, he still says we continued to sin against them. Now, preachers throughout the ages have loved to point out the things that are wrong. They love to tell us about sin and how, how sinful we are. And some of my closest friends are, have spent their lives listening to what is wrong with them and how evil they are. They've been weighed down by guilt and instead of hearing God's forgiveness. But the truth is most of us, we're, we're not such a bad bunch if we compare ourselves to many of the evil people in the world. You see, this is not about being properly evil. This is not about us being so evil that we are despicable and, and horrible people. But this is about a condition of the human heart. Isaiah forms a progression here. His poetry goes from the sin in verse 5, which is really about missing the mark. It's about a tendency to get it wrong. We aim at the good things, but we just miss it. And then he goes on to use some more words, not just missing the mark, not just in a sense an inability to just always get it right, but he says we've become unclean. And the word unclean is ceremonial. It's, it's, a, it's an uncleanliness which can come even unintentionally when normal, natural things happen in our lives. So, for instance, over the monthly cycle of a woman or when a, a, a man has experienced an, um, you know, an emission of, of bodily fluids, um, we become unintentionally unclean. And he, he talks about this to show that sometimes sin is something that just happens in our lives and, and we can become unclean through natural things we do just because of the brokenness of the world and how we're involved I'm sure all of us have stories about how that's happened. But then he goes on to say, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You see, he's saying that even the good things we do, sometimes they just have the wrong intentions. Sometimes we intend to do something good, but it just comes out all wrong. And that's the way it can be. The, even the righteousness, the good things, the nice things we want to do for others can hurt them. 
And we experience that in the cultures in our, in our country where we misunderstand each other. And sometimes we say things or do things which can just hurt each other. And then he says, as a result of all of this, what happens is we begin to shrivel up like a leaf. There's a deathly outcome. A leaf goes brown and it dies and a wintry deathliness comes upon us. Out of things that seemingly are not so bad at all. And then he says, like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We, we become, in a sense, because of all of this and the weight of it on our lives, incapable of affecting a positive outcome. We try all we like, but somehow things just seem to go wrong. Uh, Mother Teresa famously says, the greatest sorrow in us is sin. Despite all that she faced around us, she said the greatest sorrow is sin. Understanding that no matter how much good you try and do, this sin, this brokenness is right there with us. And, and so sin begins with just a tendency, but it becomes so much more. And Th Thomas Midgley Jr., a famous inventor from the 20th century, in 1921, he invented, working for the Ford Motor Corporation, he invented leaded petrol. And it changed the way we moved about because suddenly engines could be smooth and people could have great luxury vehicles. And then in 1937, the same scientist won an engineering award for inventing Freon 12. Now you'll know it as a chlorofluorocarbon. Now these two inventions single-handedly destroyed the ozone layer for us so that we had to wear 50 factor sunscreen by the 1990s. Now something which the world heralded as a greatest invention just became something which broke the world. The point is here is that even the things we think are great and good can be things which break the world. Now we ought not be weighed down by this. The point our eyes to, to, trying to make is not about how bad we are, but it's about going inward. He says we have continued to sin and we have become unclean. Uh, saying there is no one who is without this condition. We're all caught up in it. And right now there are a lot of places to level criticism. There are a lot of places where we look outside of ourselves to find this sin. We look at Donald Trump and we all have a ream of things we can say about him. Jacob Zuma um, and Ace Magashula. We, Shepherd Bushiri in Malawi right now. We, we all have these things we'll say about them and look how bad it is. The world is corrupt. We, we may blame political organizations or institutions or financial institutions for, for robbing the poor. We, we could blame all sorts of things. But as eyes guidance is, look within. You see, the point is that the sin isn't out there. The sin is within. The brokenness isn't all out there in the world. Brokenness happens within us. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and continually fall short of God's glory. And John the Apostle writes in his letter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. And then Jesus makes this confession of our sin as part of his great prayer that he teaches the apostles in Matthew chapter 6. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The point is that sin is not just out there, it's in here. Bear, the, the bearing of the holy arm begins with our contrite heart, which David reminds us about in Psalm 51. It's not that you're bad in the most despicable way, it's but that we all tend to go away from the perfect way that God has modeled for us in Jesus. This way of self-sacrifice, of turning the other cheek, of going the extra mile, dying for our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. You see, confession and contrition are the beginning of the rumbling, beginning of the earthquake and fire. And finally, th thirdly, the heavens have already been torn apart in Jesus Christ. Isaiah asks in chapter 5, how then can we be saved? Isaiah's message is one which points forward. At the end of the sermon comes the promise, Isaiah 65, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. You see, there is a future where things will be right, will be as God intended. But the promise begins in Isaiah in chapter 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
and Prince of Peace. The Messiah, Jesus. By his stripes we are healed, says Isaiah. We, he was pierced for our iniquities, says Isaiah. Upon him has been laid the sin of all. He bore the sin of many, preaches the prophet Isaiah. Peter the Apostle writes in 2 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. He, he's giving us, us the opportunity to move from this place of sin into a place where our righteous acts are no longer filthy rags, but they're washed clean. Though we were as scarlet, Isaiah says, we shall be white as snow. By his wounds we have been made healed, for we were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. John the Beloved, he wrote of Jesus in John 1.12, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And Jesus says in John 7, If anyone is thirsty, then come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Now, the, the streams of living water flowing from within the one who believes in Christ is the rending of the heavens so that God would change the world. So, so maybe th this is you. Maybe you, like me, have come to Jesus. And I came to the Lord 43 years ago. Look back at it and let him refresh you as you dwell on the forgiveness and love of God you experienced. Now, in the past three weeks, I've I've been on a voyage of rediscovery of this love and forgiveness that I found at the cross of Jesus 43 years ago. Now, I encourage you, regardless of how academic and clever we think we are, don't despise that moment at which you discovered the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus, that you went on your knees and you asked for forgiveness and you received Christ Jesus. It is not naive or childish. It's the way we receive Jesus and the way we become the people that God intends us to be. The great prophets preachers. You see, the point of Isaiah is that the, world, the way the world is changed or repaired is through changed hearts, through my heart and your heart. It's not through great programs and great social action, but it is through your heart and my heart being changed. That will lead to the great social action which will change the world. So maybe you've known about him your whole life. Maybe, you, maybe you've tried to please him. Maybe you believe those sermons which have told you you're just a terrible person and you ought to do better. That's not the sermon Isaiah preaches, all the word that Jesus gives us. You see, we come to Jesus, who is Lord, who has rend the heavens. But he rend it not in vengeance, not to bear a holy arm which would strike out his enemies, but he did it in love for you and I. While we were still, still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies of the cross. So what we do is we come to him in humility with the contrite heart of David. We confess our sins in humility and we receive him as our friend, as our brother. So let me tell you why that funeral was an easy one. A funeral of that young man of 13. Because those who were there, those who listened, his dad and the rest of the family, they had met the one who came down. They had met the one who rent the heavens and came down in love. And the truth of, truth of his love was in their hearts. So that they knew, regardless of what had happened to this young man, lives had been changed. And they had been strengthened through this young man's faith. You see, was it about heaven? Well, sure. But this young man had changed the hearts of those around him. He, he had been, in his broken state, a history maker. A game changer. You see, the kind actions that came from his relationship with Jesus, the way he brought goodness and kindness into others' lives, rippled through the community for a long time. And there is a way that the mountains will tremble, but it begins with that prayer of confession. And forgive me, O Lord, and then I receive you, for you are the, you are the one who saves, for that is how we can be saved. The Lord has rent the heavens. Love came down to earth. And you are not, and I are his plan for the better way. We're the history makers. We're the game changers. We're the ones who allow God to rend the heaven. This is Jesus' plan. You will be my witnesses. We will be the ones, as Jesus' followers, to change this world. Go inwards. Pray for forgiveness. Receive and believe again. 
and then let's wait for the rumbling to start. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And I encourage you, if you'd like to pray that prayer, or if you just don't know where to go from here, or how to even articulate this, get a hold of me. The details are all in the bulletin. And let's pray together and work this out together. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.